I didn't even know Ganga was sacred. I didn't know the Himalayas were sacred. Every soul has seven innate sanskars, which is called Satu Guni Atma. Matlab, har atma saat ki bani. Life itself is, is such a big gift, it's such a big joy, it's such a big experience that the words can't even limit what life is, right? And I think that and the beauty about that is it's, it's universal. As the tears poured out of my eyes, I knew this is where I need to be. I knew that I had come home. A very warm welcome to this new podcast edition of Think Right today. And we are really privileged and overjoyed to be joined by Sadhvi Bhagwati Saraswati Ji with us here today, along with our ever radiant and divine sister Shivani. Uh, and I think today's conversation is going to be one where we are going to look at many different aspects of mindfulness that are rarely talked about. And uh, I think through the lens and journeys of, you know, uh, two very different but still very similarly connected spiritual beings, one who has moved from San Francisco and from the corridors of Stanford to the sacred Ganges. Uh, and I think that's been a, a transformational life. And of course, uh, Sister Shivani, who has continued to to strengthen and guide us and see how we can, you know, take Think Right into the hearts and minds of every single individual on the planet. And I think today's opportunity of really looking at a Western India perspective and really connecting as human beings and really how do we find that common thread that exists pretty much in all of life. But what it takes to make that happen is a simple mindful realization first of who we are in a manner that we can then empower ourselves to not only become the best versions of us as, as individuals, but really use that to then connect to many others and make a much larger difference in the world. So it's a very interesting subject, very interesting conversation. And maybe, you know, to begin with Sadhviji, uh, maybe you can take us a little bit through this transformative journey in your life. I mean, uh, what brought you uh, to India and, and really how did that shift happen? And a little background around some of that before we go into your experiences sure. here. <laughs> sure. And it's such a, such a joy and such an honor and such a blessing to be here and be with you both today. For me, it's really been a story of grace. My ego would love to say that I recognized the shallowness and the superficiality of a purely material culture and viewpoint, and that I had prayed to God to give me a guru or to show me something different. But although my ego would love that, it's not actually true. I was an academic. I was 25. I had grown up in Los Angeles, quite literally in Hollywood, hence the Hollywood to Himalayas title. And I had grown up in a family and a culture of great prosperity, great abundance, great opportunity, great privilege, whether from a financial perspective or an educational perspective, anyway. And I then continued in my life to achieve in that way. I graduated from Stanford. I was in the midst of getting my PhD in psychology. And in the West, we have what I think of as a happiness equation, where we're taught, oh, if you want to be happy, here's what you need. You need a good education. You need a good degree. You need a good job that makes money. You need a right house with a rightly placed white picket fence and you need to vacation at the right resorts, et cetera, et cetera. And when you have those things, we were what I now call happy by default, meaning we had those things and therefore we must have been happy. I didn't know anyone. I had never read a book about anyone who actually was living a deeply spiritual life. So it never actually occurred to me 
that this was something to ask for, to seek for, to search for, to yearn for. It was always just a matter of, oh, if you have these things and you're not happy, you should have different things or you should have more things. Mm -hmm. I came to India at 25 actually because I, in addition to being an avid traveler, and I had traveled throughout Europe and South America and across the US, I was a very strict vegetarian. And when India was suggested, I actually agreed to come only because I knew that I could actually eat pure, like, pukka <laughs> vegetarian food without having to argue with waiters in languages that I didn't speak about, was there chicken broth in their mm. vegetable soup, or was there eggs in this, or fish in that? And come to Rishikesh, and that too was just, it was grace. This was 1996, there was no Google. We had a 500-page Lonely Planet guidebook that we opened up in Delhi, and I said, Rishikesh. I mean, it was just like that. Open up a book, Rishikesh, it's relatively close to Delhi. It has mountains, it has a river. I didn't even know Ganga was sacred. I didn't know the Himalayas were sacred. I just knew, sounds like a natural, beautiful place. Come to Rishikesh. And I stand on the banks of Ganga, this river that I didn't even know was holy. I didn't know it was the mother goddess. And I had this experience of suddenly being in the presence of the divine. And it began by looking out over Ganga. But then even as I turned my head, it didn't matter what I looked at a child, a woman, a man, a telephone pole, a tree, a step. That presence of the divine was there in all of it. And it knocked me to the ground in tears. And the other aspect of it that was so incredible was I recognized in that moment, I felt that I was not separate from that divine that it wasn't just the divine was everywhere. I mean, and I had never been a religious person. And I wasn't I was even about one about to ask exactly Never that. had been religious, wasn't even one of those people who say, well, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. Neither of those. I was an academic, I was a scientist, managing my day-to-day -day life and my emotions and my relationships and my schoolwork was kind of all that my mental framework had space for. So it never even occurred to me to be religious or spiritual. And I had always moved through the world, though, with a really palpable sense that there was something not quite right about me. And some of that stemmed, I think, from just general Western upbringing, that you're not beautiful enough, or you're not smart enough, or you're not popular enough. Some of it stemmed from my own personal experiences of suffering and challenges that I had been through. But suddenly in that moment on Ganga, I was inseparable from the divine that pervaded everything. And as the tears poured out of my eyes, I knew this is where I need to be. I knew that I had come home. And that was really the, yeah. you could say, either the end <laughs> or, or the beginning. beginning. It was the, the end of act one of my, my life and the, the beginning yeah. of the rest. And that was 27 years ago. And, and, and at that time, that experience, did you really describe it as divine? I mean, given that you were not, what, what was that? Was there a, because, you know, many times vocabulary actually limits uh, the experience, yeah. right? Because... To someone, it's divine. I mean, what was, if you had to give a word at that time to describe it, what, what would you call it? I was non, oh, I was non verbal at that yeah, time. Absolutely. That's why yeah. I was laughing when you were asking yeah, because yeah, yeah. there were no semantics. Yeah, yeah. It was days and days before I actually could say anything other than, oh my God, it's so beautiful. Yeah. Oh my God, it's so beautiful. Oh my God, it's so beautiful. I, I had no words. I had no semantics. I had no framework. 
But it didn't matter because through grace, that thinking mind, that analytic mind, that mind that really serves as the impediment. I mean, it's a fantastic tool to balance your checkbook and a real impediment when you want to connect with the divine. That mind became quiet. Yeah. automatically, it, through no merit of my own. I had not done any set of practices or sadhana. It just, through grace, became quiet. And because it was quiet, I didn't need words. Yeah. I was able, I think if I had now in retrospect to give a word, the word I would give was surrender. Mm. I was able to just surrender to the wordless perfection of the experience. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I think that's really the the beginning of this conversation in a way, because I still remember when we were trying to verbalize what is this journey that you know education teaches us in a particular way on how you should speak or what you should act, and we say, oh, the source of that is thought. And then if we can be more mindful of the thought and then, you know, we bring the word mind in. And I still agree, if you go on the street and you ask anybody, where is your mind? You'll get a host of different answers, yes. right? Because many of these are just experiences that we try and verbalize and then, you know, stick to a logic to try and, you know, convince this. So I think being able to feel an experience or be in that presence or in that moment of those kinds of experiences and that leading to attraction of more of those is really the way most people should be living their lives. And and thank you for, you know, opening up this conversation with this wonderful experience. And I'm going to come to you, Sister Shivani, because I mean, you, of course, have had a very different journey from India. And today, as you take this message of the same experience to the west, to the inner interior parts of India, to different places. How how do you sense people looking at accepting you know some of these thought processes? How does one really understand that if I can be a little more mindful, if I can be a little more connected, I can become a better version? So maybe through your own experience and your experience as you engage with many others first thing that spirituality teaches us, something that we should have known since we were kids, but it was not part of our education. The answer to who am I? You know, so who am I? What I'm taught as a child is just my name, my family, and then my school, and then what I do. And so that is the conditioning. You know, so that is the conditioning of I. And when I look at that conditioning, then we are all very different. Then we'll say she's from the West. We are from India, then from India, when we which this part of India, then even religion, even caste, these are all our conditioning. Conditioning means we we identified ourselves with that particular label, which was very important. This is my country, this is my religion, this is my city where I live, this is my school where I go. But none of them are I. None of them are I. So, but earlier we didn't know the I. So we connected to each other through the my. So I will say, you're a male, I'm a female. And then with her, I will say, okay, you're from the West, I'm from Bharat. I'll say, you're Christian, I'm Hindu. You know, so all, so always there will be a difference. There will be, you are different, I'm different. And then uh, your attachment to who you are and my attachment to who I am, that vibration would be different. And then when we start practicing ripping out those labels, and just coming to the I, that the labels are very important. It's not that they are not important, but they are not the I. They are my label. And most important is I'm on a journey. Like the experience that Sadviji has shared, why did she turn the book and say Rishikesh? I'm sure that book must have had a lot of other cities or towns of the country, right? Why Rishikesh? And why after reaching there without any knowledge, why the experience? Because the experience was not of this body or this name or the country that she's come from. This experience was of the soul. And why the soul has had that experience, 99.9% .9 chances are that she has been in Rishikesh before. Yes. Mm. She has been in Rishikesh 
the ganga which she was seeing and feeling for the first time is where she has lived mm. she has lived for many years yes. over there she's done lot of tapasya over there so her connect with rishikesh with the ganga with mm. that vibration was deep it was very deep anybody coming there for a first time will not have this experience mm. so but that we can only understand when we remember that i am not this body i am this soul using this body but when i was in another dress mm. i'd been here before mm. and that's why when i come there again for me it will be like this is it because it was just a gap between that connect of those yes. 27 years right. 27 years but when you go back to where you have spent yeah. maybe one lifetime or two one. lifetimes you will just connect you don't need logic anymore for that yeah. in fact log- you try to logically understand it and then logic is not going to give you any answers because it's not about the logic it's not about my uh, logical mind which is going to answer it it's just that i know this is right mm-hmm. and my logic will say like what are you finding so right about it I'm like but i know <laughs> this is right so that's that difference between the logic and the intuitive mind and sometimes that intuitive and logic is not going to go hand in hand but the intuitive will always win over the logic because that intuitive is very powerful because the logic is coming from my conditioning after coming into this body and the intuitive is coming from i the core so that core will always give the right answer so now when we meet people whether we are going towards the towns or the villages of the country or you are going to america or europe you know we don't look at them with that consciousness only because we are not looking at ourselves through that consciousness mm-hmm. so we are just going to meet everybody saying i am a soul meeting another soul mm-hmm. so that vibration when one person removes that vibration the other soul will also receive a different vibration it's like if you look at somebody through a role you know suppose you're the head of your company okay and you are in that consciousness i'm the head of my company now you connect to one of your team people they will also be in that awareness okay i am so then it's a role connecting to another role so there's going to be a difference but if you just remove that role consciousness and you say i am a person connecting to another person there will be a change but then you go deeper and you say i am a soul connecting to another soul completely different mm-hmm. so that's about removing those labels that we have acquired in this lifetime so once we start on this journey of practicing that soul consciousness which means opposite of ego consciousness so the more we will experience soul consciousness in our own life the more it will influence other people with the same vibration so if i meet maybe anybody whatever mm. role but if i don't get awed by their role and say oh so and so is so and so if i get awed by that so and so is so and then that so and so will also say i am so and so mm. okay but if i say i am a soul meeting another soul that soul will also just meet you i am a soul meeting another soul so you just need that vibration coming from one to trigger that in the other because innately the other one is also mm. a soul yes. so you're not creating anything new with yeah. them they are who they are but they need that vibration so uh, you know when we go to different places or countries people say oh so how are you liking it coming here how is it different from anything mm-hmm. like i'm not finding anything <laughs> different <laughs> not finding yeah. anything different yeah. Yeah. yes people's conditionings are different so if the issue in a rural part of country will be different from what is an issue in america mm-hmm. it be different issues are different but that soul the need of that soul right now all say doesn't matter where we are so it's not about them it's more about us doing our work so the more we cleanse ourselves the easier it becomes to connect to the other person and also to empower them to be able to emerge that in them yeah you know cleanse because everybody's intrinsically the same with the same characteristic is just a layer of dust to dirt yes. that you know and and the beauty to what you said is if one does it it yes. automatically radiates yes. to the others in a in a community and maybe you know sadhvi ji to your earlier point when we were talking about seeking happiness or you know even you know sister shivani as you were talking about issues are different uh, or what people believe through their verbalization and what they see around them or their conditioning to be the true levers of joy and happiness are again all 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 layers and and i think 
this is intrinsic today in society, right? I mean, and if we are talking to larger audiences and we talk of this and they say, oh, this is a great session for me to hear. But, you know, I'm going back and I'm going to go and I'm going to play my role. I am going to be in a position. I'll have to earn my livelihood. I have to feed my family. So what's the message to to, to that, right? As we said, this like, what should we start? What What can a person practically do? I mean, I don't know if you have some sure. thoughts. Yeah. So I have two thoughts, mm -hmm. one to the first piece of what you said and one to the second piece. With regard to the first piece of the happiness, in the early days, something impacted me so deeply there that is still very true in terms of issues and happiness and culture. And it was something aside from the spiritual awakening transformation touch that I had that made me know I was meant to stay. It was something that actually did later appeal to my logical mind when it kind of kicked back in, which was the happiness of the people who lived there. Now, in the last almost 30 years, Rishikesh has changed a lot. But you go back 27 years ago, and it was much, 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 much less developed. And what I noticed was whether it was the children who didn't even have shoes, whether it was the women carrying pounds of firewood on their head through the jungles back home to cook the one meal a day, whether it was sweepers on the street, everybody was happy. And in the world that I came from, you'd ask somebody getting out of a Mercedes car or a BMW car, you know, how are you? And they'd give you a whole list of things that were wrong. I said, this happened, that happened, this was problematic. And here you say to the lady, walking through the jungle with all of the wood on her head, you say, Aap kaise? And she says, Bas sab Ganga ki krapa. Bas sab Bhagwan ki krapa. And that, that state, because it's not a feeling, it's not an emotion, it's not a wave that comes and goes, like today I got good wood, therefore I'm happy. It's a state of being that exists completely independent from it rained today, it was dry today, it was hot today, it was cool today, I cut wood easily today, I didn't cut wood easily today. A state of being that is everything is God's blessing. And that was so diametrically opposite from what I had experienced. And it took me a long time to realize that that was the secret. But in the beginning, I was acutely aware of the fact that there was a secret of happiness here and that I needed to stay long enough to find out what it was because no one I knew with everything had that level of happiness. Mm -hmm. And of course, by the time I figured it out, the but the katamogia thai was this was home. But with regard to your second aspect of the these two layers, this I am soul, and I feel it and I experience it when I meditate and when I listen to this, and yet, hey, I've got this job to do. Well, I think for me, the simplest and easiest way of thinking about this is the line that Bhagwan Krishna gives in the Bhagavad Gita, where he says, Mam nusmar yudhyacha. I mean, if you want a super, super simple mantra of the yes and, because it's, it is yes and, it's not either or. It's yes and. Yes, I am soul. I am divinity, I am one with God, and I'm here in a human incarnation that is not insignificant or irrelevant. I've got a very particular karmic journey that again is not insignificant or irrelevant, it's quite important. And my responsibility in this incarnation is to fulfill it with all of the sincerity, all of the connection, not with indifference or apathy or complacency or laziness because, hey, I'm a soul, so who cares? 
Because otherwise, if you've only got this one piece and you've got it in a very shallow way, like you tune into this podcast for 30 seconds and then you tune out, you walk away with something that's not partial truth, but it's actually untruth. Because you walk away then with something that negates this whole other aspect of life. And when I think about Bhagwan Krishna's teaching, it feels so simple. Remember me, Mamnusmar, remember me, which of course means remember you. Because you're not separate from God. Remember who you are. Remember that you are not separate from God. Remember that you're the one who was never born, who never dies. Remember that you are the one who doesn't change. That you are not the role, you're not the story, you're not the narrative. And you, Dicha, fight the war. <laughs> yeah. Do the duty. Pick up your bow and arrow. Put on your bow and arrow costume, your fighting war costume. Speak your fighting war script. Play the role fully and completely and sincerely, but do not forget. You know, I grew up in Hollywood. And in my entire life, whether there, whether here, whether anywhere, you never hear of any actor or actress who plays the part of a villain or a murderer in some movie or TV show who ends up going home and killing their family because they forgot it was only a role. Mm -hmm. Like in the entire history of drama, I don't think it's ever happened. Even though they're playing the role, they are always 100% of the time. Even the very best character actors and actresses who just, you know, fully become the role. Nonetheless, they're always aware that they're not the role. And they're not going to go out and kill somebody accidentally because they forgot. In the same way, we remember who we are. Soul, spirit, consciousness, divinity, God, ahambra, masmi, whatever words you use, it doesn't matter. That's who I am. And here's my duty. Here's my dharma. Here's the particular role I've been given in this seen this act of the cosmic drama and I have to play it fully and completely. Doing from a state of being. Absolutely. <laughs> irrespective of what one does. I think, Absolutely. I think being connected in that manner and then expressing whatever is happening around you from that that state. I think even the first part that you addressed, that that woman who's told you that, you know, Ganga Kinari, it, you said it came from a state of being. And I think in the West, we'll reflect it as an attitude. Oh, this person has a positive attitude compared to somebody who's not so positive. And therefore, I think many times when we, we use words, and I think, you know, it's interesting that this podcast is really, to me, becoming about the limitation of vocabulary mm. and how we are so much larger, stronger, can create so much more impact than even words, what words can express. And I think it's... In very extreme situations that sometimes we will say sorry, whether it's a state of grief or something that we have no words to express. I think life itself is, is such a big gift, it's such a big joy, it's such a big experience that the words can't even limit what life is, right? And I think that and the beauty about that is it's, it's universal. It doesn't matter someone who is experiencing that in the West, someone who's experiencing that, as you were mentioning, in a tier two, tier three cities, where the language doesn't connect, it's the presence of that that radiates. And I, and I think for people to be able to understand the power of this, and you know, it just takes a little experience to just go deeper, as we all know. Uh, it's interesting, as you were talking of ages, I realized something, uh, you know, that we, three of us are all in our early 50s, I'm presuming because of the part of the journey and, and knowing. And you know, sometimes different triggers happen to people at different points in their life. And I think sometimes the only regret you have is, oh, I mean, I should have felt this when I was a little kid, I would have had just a far better experience, you know, even living this part of the journey. 
and a conversation that I hear from many people who are my peers and others, oh, I'm too young to get spiritual. You know, I mean, you know, when I age, you know, that's the time when, you know, I will figure out later in life. And I think that's a myth mm -hmm. that somewhere we have to kind of break because the earlier one figures this out, it's just the quality of life that you will live. Like what you mentioned, suffering, etc. are all triggers that come to you to be able to say, hey, wake up, wake up, wake up. But we don't wake up, right? I mean, I just think that that's probably it. So I don't know, you meet so many people, you know, Sister Shivani, and <clears throat> I'm sure you've seen so many experiences that trigger this and happen at coming in your presence, coming in contact with you, I hear so many people say their life has changed. So just touching people at different points. How do you see that shift when it's, you know, with younger people, middle-aged, older people? Is there a way for us to accelerate this thought process or is it just going to happen when it needs to happen? <laughs> Again, it's not about the age of the body. Yes, correct. You know, so it's not about the age of the body. Of course, because we believe that we need to do it when we are older. That's why we don't experiment with it. We don't, we don't really want, we feel we don't need it right now. And that's also because in the culture of Bharat, earlier we had this, you know, this four, um, what was it called? The four as four, uh -huh, four ashrams. So what Purushat. is the first? Uh, matlab, uh, it's your childhood, then your yes. yuva, yeah. then your grahast, and then your yeah. vanprast, yeah. you know, so four. Now that is the four is of the role actually. So when you're a child, it's about education, it's about what you're doing, and you become you. Then you are in the grahast, you're yes. looking after your family. So only after you finish your grahast responsibilities, then you can become a vanprasti, which means like retirement. You retire from your role, and then you can probably spend more time on this. So we are still holding on to that. Mm. But here, spirituality is not saying that you have to retire and then experiment soul consciousness. So you can start experimenting with it even when you're in the nursery. It's not about changing the role. Those four segments that we were told, it was about our roles. It was not about the soul. It was our roles that this first 25 years, this is your role. Education, study, next 25 years, work, next 25. So that was on the role. But here, spirituality is not talking about changing your role. So some people will say, so, why did you leave from there and go there? So we still think it's like there and there. Why did you do engineering and then go there? So we think they're two different paths. And so some people will say you wasted one engineering seat. So, so we just have to smile and say like, okay. <laughs> but so they think because you did this, you had to be there. So roles can be different. But I think from the first things that we start teaching a child, the way to speak, we should be taught at that time that this is my body. Yeah. I'm wearing this body. And uh, through this body, I need to eat, drink, talk, sleep, all this. But innately, I'm a pure, divine, peaceful, happy soul. Should have been taught when we were like this. And then that child would have grown up remembering in that awareness that happiness is who I am always. You know, it's who I am always is not something that I have to experience through the organs of this body. Today, we're trying to experience happiness through the sense organs. So through what I see, to, through what I listen, through what I eat. I'm getting very bored. Let's eat something new to feel happy. So we're trying because I think this is who I am. So I think this is what needs the happiness. So I'm trying to give this happiness through what I touch, through what I listen. All these mistakes I'm making only because I think this is who I am. So this is the one who needs happiness. Then I need it through what I achieve. Mm. So only because I was not told, only because I don't remember. So when I remember that I'm a soul, it doesn't mean I will become passive and I will not want to achieve or I will not want to excel and do more. It's just that I will do it with the right understanding that I'm a soul, I'm happy, peaceful, and now I'm going to go out into the world and achieve. And on my journey, I'm going to meet a lot of souls. So I'm not going to be superior to anybody, inferior to anybody. Roles could be yeah. different. Relationships could be different. Age of the body could be different. So now even our consciousness, if I meet a child like 
this just now i was in a school all these kids little <laughs> little it was their first day of school mm. so they were like but i cannot see them like a child so whether i'm talking to the principal of the school or i'm talking to this child i've just realized it's not making any difference to me it's your vocabulary yeah. could be childish yeah. when you're talking to them but that equality that i'm <clears throat> talking to the same just because i know that the one in this body 100 years they've already spent in another one and mm. in another one so they both are same they both are equal now that changes the way i look at them what i feel for them i'm not feeling oh you're this oh you're this because i'm not going to connect to the role not to the age of the body not to the gender of the body also mm. yeah. so everything changes so it's not that we are not going to work achieve and do role but while doing what you're doing you're going to be doing it a different way yeah. so you will do it but you're not going to say stress is normal yeah. because you will say happiness is normal because happiness is who I am. Challenges are there, pressures are there, but I know I'm happy. I'm not working for happiness. All this had to be taught to me. All this had to be taught to me. I would have just gone on the same journey in a different way, mm. in a different way. And that's what parents need to do now. So instead of saying, oh, it's too early, we should say we should have started this in and that's why we say the best time for spirituality is when you're expecting a child because then mm. you will sow the seed of that understanding that consciousness you will even nurture that child with that consciousness we even take newborn children and we talk to them okay so where have you come from yeah. i literally talk yeah. to them like that so where have you come from are you thinking of your parents who you left behind and you can see the child responding People will say, like, the child is not going to understand what you are saying. I said, you wait. That soul understands everything that we are saying. Mm -hmm. And I meet so many children who will just immediately connect like this. Initially, like, I am meeting them for the first time. And then their mother would say, you know what, I have been watching the video when I was carrying the child. Mm -hmm. So the soul understands everything. But it's only on the journey we don't tell them and we go on covering them with layers and layers mm -hmm. and layers. But when they are babies, they are 100% soul consciousness. Mm -hmm. Then we are like, no, you are not this, yeah. you are this, you are this, you are this. And we put all those layers of roles and positions. And then that child forgets I'm a soul. Yeah. Baby. And that's why if you see a baby is so attractive. Yeah. Even if you're in a supermarket, everybody will look towards a baby. Everyone look towards a baby. Because a baby is egoless. A baby is soul conscious. Without knowing that it's soul conscious, it's naturally soul conscious. So everyone gets attracted towards a child. Three years later, that child will look different. Ten years later, that child will look different. But when that child is in that stage, before those labels have been put up, they are 100% in that egoless stage. And so spirituality says, now all those labels that you put on yourself, go back and become childlike. Yeah. Yeah. See, a child doesn't say, this one is senior, this one is not. For the child, everybody is the same. That unconditional acceptance, that unconditional love, that is soul consciousness. Yeah. So, what age should we learn it? Yeah, you know, which age should we learn yeah, it? Yeah. Why go through all that ego and stress and all that aggression, and then undo and then go back there? Yeah, the earlier you know, we learn, so the better it is. It's really what you said that you know that state of being is so pure. Yeah. When you're a child, we <laughs> add layers through our life, forgetting yes. that state. So, if all we could say that everything else we are doing from that state. And that state stays with us throughout this physical life. This complication of getting spiritual and or getting spiritual at some point would all evaporate. Otherwise, one adds all the layers, and then again just getting those layers back to go to where we started. Yes. Look at kids Rather playing. Than, you know, look at yeah? kids playing. Yeah. Yeah. They can use language. They can say to each other. They can push each other. But they will get back and they'll yeah. be back. Yeah. Yeah. Today we are like, why did she say this yeah. to me? Yeah. So two, the, years uh, yeah, two years ago. Yeah, two years ago. So that's what. So the more I increase that ego, when all these complications are yeah. only coming no, with that absolutely. ego. So the yeah. children are egoless. So they are like they can fight right now, yeah. and next minute they are again yeah. chatting and. No, and and you know, you you also earlier said right. We contextualize, and is like just going on thinking from that vocabulary. We say my body. Yeah. We tell them my clothes, my. But we don't tell them. Yeah. Then who are who you? Who am I? Mm -hmm. If you, if this is your body, means it's definitely not you. Yeah. So what are you? So if we could 
kind of talk a little more about that mm. at an early stage yes. and maybe evolved societies in the earlier times they did. had people so you could play roles like what yeah. you were talking of a Hollywood yeah. and you know in India we have Bollywood yes. and many people relate to every role and yes. they can see whether it's you know romance whether it is you know the family dramas that happen and they can all relate to it and they when you look at it from somebody else's life or when you look at it in a movie you say it's a drama but when it comes to you it just feels like yeah. oh my god this yeah. is the you know end of life so it's a it's a dichotomy that you know people need to probably you know get past but i was just thinking also on the uh, you know the other part that you were just mentioning that at the end of the day you know everybody is 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 playing a role in a particular kind of an outcome right so how does one then put more meaning you know to assuming one understands you're doing from a state of being then you know the questions come is how much of this is destiny how much is my choice and multiple thoughts keep coming and you know as we are talking today we are addressing trying to address audiences from children to you know to 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 anyone and and at different stages of this thought process so i mean how does one look at it i mean any thoughts around that so It's a huge and beautiful and critical area. It encompasses the who am I and why am I here in this body and why do I have these circumstances and how much is my free will. I think starting with the latter part, what we know in our whether we say Bhartiya Sanskriti, whether we say Sanatana Dharma, whether we say Vedic tradition, whatever words we use for it in our tradition, we believe, and of course we have scientific evidence as well, but we, we believe very deeply in reincarnation. We believe that not only are we soul, but that the soul, or soul rather, is not born, doesn't die, but, and there's a lot of different analogies and metaphors, of course, but one that I find helpful is waves on the ocean. If you imagine that the ocean was infinite, not that you had seven different oceans, but that you had only one infinite ocean, and then you have waves in the ocean. So when a wave rises up in the ocean, it's there, means it's not an optical illusion. When we say illusion, it doesn't mean that, oh, it's a mirage of water in the desert. It's there, and yet, if you take a spoonful of water from the wave and you look at it under a microscope, it's not going to say wave. It's going to say ocean. If a scientist examines that, they're never going to say, oh, this is, this is wave. It's, this is ocean. So even in its waveness, it has never stopped being ocean. Mm -hmm. It's not that I go into a body and then I go back to being a soul, and then I go into a body and then I go back to being a soul. It's that even in this body, I've never stopped being soul. It's just in this particular moment, in this intersection of time and space, this wave, I, the ocean, am now in this form. But then you think about free will and reincarnation and why this form and our destiny, as you say. So given your reminder about the age range of the audience, I'm gonna give for me what's always been a really great example. It was an example that my guru, Pujaswamiji, Pujaswami Chidanan Saraswatiji, gave to me when I had first come to India and first started learning about karma, because it's not part of the Judeo-Christian mm -hmm. traditions. It's not what I had been born with. And he said, because my feeling was, well, if everything's due to the past and everything's kind of pre-written, why meditate? Why pray? Why read scripture? Why do anything? Why think right? Right? Why does it matter if it's all predestined? And he gave me this beautiful example. He said, let's imagine 
that the sum total of all of your past actions, all your past karmas, was that in this moment you have a cow. Okay? You can't rewind life. You can't go back and have a kitty cat instead. You've got a cow. That you can consider your destiny of this moment is the cow. The cow gives us milk. If we drink it, if we make yogurt and ghee and paneer and whatnot, we're nourished and healthy. And a cow gives us gober. And if we put that in a field, it's a fantastic organic fertilizer. Our field blossoms and flourishes and thrives and we can feed people. But if you eat the manure and you pour the milk in your field, you will get sick and your crops will die. But that was not predestined until you ate the manure and poured the milk in your field. Your destiny was the cow. What you do with the cow, what you do with the white stuff and the brown stuff and the yellow stuff is your free will. And that's why we work on cultivating buddhi and shuddhi, our intelligence, our purity, our understanding, our wisdom. It's why we meditate. It's why we have gurus. It's why we read scripture. It's why we listen to satsang. It's why we listen to things like this. Is so that I can know what to do with the metaphoric white stuff and brown stuff in my life. Because with a cow, of course, we know, oh, this is manure, it goes in the field. This is milk, I drink it. But life is not always quite so clear. Situations arise, and we don't know. We don't know necessarily. How do I move through this in the most dharmic way? How do I fulfill my dharma here? How do I fulfill my duty here? And that's where both our inner tools of meditation, of introspection, of contemplation, and the tools that we have of masters and gurus and scriptures that we get to help us make that choice. So yes, you have a destiny. Yes, your destiny is predestined. And yet right here, right now in this moment, is the pre of that which is predestined for you in the next moment. So you are literally creating your destiny right here, right now, through your actions, through your choices, through your thoughts, mm -hmm. that of course propel the actions and thoughts mm -hmm. and choices, which is why, lastly, coming to that aspect of who am I, that's why it's so important to know who we are, because if we don't know who we are, we have no idea what to do. I mean, if you think about the animal kingdom, if I don't know if I'm a dog or I'm a lion or I'm a sheep or I'm an earthworm or I'm a caterpillar, how do I know whether I'm supposed to weave a cocoon and become a butterfly or I'm supposed to chase down a zebra and eat it or I'm supposed to wag my tail and bark and like let myself be pet by my master? If I don't know what I am, I don't know what to do. And within us, as Sister Shivaniji was saying so beautifully, we identify so much as our roles that we believe I am. Oh, I went to medical school. I'm now a practicing physician. I am a doctor. I am a lawyer. I am an engineer. I am this or I am angry. And we identify so much as that that we then use that as the identification, and then we act accordingly. I am angry, therefore I'm going to hit you, or scream and yell, or drown my sorrows in a six pack of beer, or whatever it may be, because I am angry. But when you realize, I am not angry, I am this happy, peaceful soul that she was speaking of, well then, okay, in the gray and white matter of my brain, in the neurons, there's currently an electrical and chemical pattern of activity that you could call arousal, and it's got a feeling state to it that is unpleasant. We will call that anger. I'm not angry. 
It's just a pattern of electrical and chemical behavior happening in the neurons of my brain. It's not who I am. And so the, the minute that I step back and I realize who am I, well, then automatically what to do becomes apparent. Yeah, no, I think, and it kind of relates so beautifully to what, you know, even you were mentioning earlier, Sister Shivani, that you act from a state of intuition. Yeah. And when you're saying, we talk of an animal, and that's a great example you give because we are all surrounded by other living beings all the time. And you look at that behavior, which is uncluttered by individuality or identity and knows exactly what to do. And it gets done and it gets done to the perfection 100% of the time. And no mistakes, like, no depression, no, mis no anxiety, Absolutely. no Every need for Every animal horses. will find food. Every animal yeah. will find everything. And sometimes we wonder, oh, how is my next meal going to come? You know, and, and I think therefore your word of what experience you had and you tried to put a word to it and you use the word surrender. And I think your word of intuition, I think when you surrender, whatever answer comes is probably your intuition. And can, can all of society, every human being actually operate from that zone is the big question. Because, you know, many a times we put logic and roles to be able to, to say we can live, you know, as a human race together, you know, because we are so different or individualistic. But I think if we come from that zone, you know, how would it be? But I, I don't know. I don't have an answer. But... I know you, very often we have our discussions and you know, it just, things just come and you know it's right because you've surrendered and, and you believe. How do we get people, because you doubt sometimes your own intuition, right? I mean, what, what are those habits? What can people do to really trust their own intuition more? Somewhere you know it is, it is right, but somewhere you, your logic kind of prevents you. So how does one think about it? So... When I understand that I'm a soul, I also know what is the quality of every soul. So when we say, what's your nature? So it's like this dress. I know the color is white, but I've been wearing it since five o'clock in the morning and I'll wear it till 10 o'clock in the night. I take care, but yet once in a while a stain here and there. But I have to remember that's the stain. The original color is white. But if I haven't taken, but now, this dress I don't wear for one day. Na? I'm wearing it for so many years. And then I change that dress and I wear another dress and another dress. And in that whole interaction, I've had a lot of stains. So like she said, I am anger. Anger is not the white. Anger is the stain which is on the original color of white. So earlier I did not know that the original color is white. So all the stains, whether it is ego, hurt, anger, irritation, whatever, I thought that's my nature. And then suddenly we've created a world which says this is normal, anger is normal, stress is normal. Then we created a world which says anger is necessary, stress is necessary to perform. So, you know, we kept on reinforcing those stains and moving away to saying, I want happiness. Now, honestly, last six months, what I've been doing <laughs> in a gathering of, let's say, 5,000, 10,000, whatever. First question, how many of you want happiness? Like there's not a single hand which is down. And, it, and they don't even think or look like, what is everybody else doing? Nothing. It just goes like, it's just impromptu, okay, without taking a pause. So how many of you want peace? So obviously you must be wanting love also. Yes. So it is like, not a single person will even think, okay, do I really want? No, it is like impromptu. So we've reached a stage where forgetting, forgetting that I, it is white, accepting that the stain is my nature, and now the stains are so much, that I am saying I want white. Mm -hmm. hmm. Correct. You see, so now I can't see white at all. Mm -hmm. So I want white. That's the stage that I have reached. And so then we are even searching even more. Now what else should I do to get that happiness? Where else should I go? I've traveled all over the country, all over the world. Now which planet to go to? <laughs> so see where we are, we are moving away. Mm -hmm. And then what is spirituality saying? Go inward. So we're like, where inside? Now go inside yeah. means what? Where am I supposed to go inside? So when I understand that I'm a soul, then the basic first information that I understand is 
एवरी सोल हैज सेवन इन एट संस्कार विच इज कॉल्ड सतो गुणी आत्मा मतलब हर आत्मा सात गुणों की बनी है मतलब दैट इज योर ओरिजिनल नेचर एंड दैट इज प्योरिटी पीस पावर हैप्पीनेस विजडम लव एंड ब्लिस दिस इज द नेचर ऑफ एवरी सोल ऑन द प्लानिट original nature that means the original color so let's say you were white she was white i were white all of us are same white first thing in the morning but during the day we had different roles so someone was in the kitchen someone mm-hmm. was in the garden so by the end of the day when we meet we have different stains but now we are connecting to each other through the stains and not through the original color of mm-hmm. white mm-hmm. but when i remember that each one is the same then my way of looking at you my way of perceiving you will change completely so even if you are shouting right now or even if you are rude right now i will say peaceful so i will not say why is he so angry so consciousness shifts from being critical judgmental about looking at people's nature to innately remember peaceful pure powerful so and when i will create this thought peaceful soul you will receive that vibration that i am creating i'm not going to say it from here it's my vibration and this will radiate to you and this will trigger that innate sanskar of peace which is there in every soul so this starts a journey of cleaning the stains and so when the more i clean the stains and closer i go to the white you're going closer to the intuition mm. intuition is there intuition means every soul has that innate sanskar of wisdom knowledge is the sanskar of every soul but the more i'm going outside looking for every answer i'm not spending time here so it's not working for me so when it works also i'm not sure whether mm. this was my answer or it's coming from somewhere else because i'm not connecting to it often because the minute i have a question i'm asking somebody else i'm going online or i'm asking people we reach the stage we asking people to take decisions we meet people who will come and say what do you think should i live with my husband or should i separate and i was like you are asking me she said yeah you tell me because you know yeah. the more the soul power will deplete there is so much clutter that they don't know what is right is it just spend time no i can't understand i don't know what i'm supposed to do so the more stains the more you move away from that intuition and you just to start cleaning this a little bit there it is there mm-hmm. it is there for you so that daily meditation is removing those stains mm-hmm. so removing ego is the main stain and with ego all the other colors are going to go off and purity will emerge and with purity will come all the other qualities of peace love so that's why meditation directly increases your intuition power mm-hmm. because it's actually clearing your stains which i have created not just in this one costume but in all this long journey and as you start cleaning those you will start getting the answer and who's giving you the answer your own innate sanskar of wisdom because i the soul know it i know the answer but i'm not pausing to ask myself so that is one step is intuition intuition will be this is my intuition second is surrender mm. so that is when i say I don't know the answer and I don't want to think of this answer. I want this answer coming from there. I don't even want that answer coming from my intuition. I don't want to create the answer. I want that force divine force to give me the answer. So I will just surrender that question and I have to stop thinking about it. Mm. Which means suppose I am your child, you are my parent and I have full faith in you that what you are going to do for me is right. So I just give you my question and then i stop thinking about it because i know now i've given it to my parent but then if i keep thinking about it i will not get the answer because now i'm still using my you know but i think it should be like this give the question or give that whatever you have and just stop thinking and then it will come like but then when like you this. give that question then you go about doing your other things you will right okay. so that question will keep so every time yeah, it so comes push it back you yeah. just say but i've already told it there oh, yeah i got yeah. answer yeah. aayega yeah. this only happens in the initial yeah. stages yeah. so it's like suppose first time i have given you a question yeah. and i have my little doubt now whether yeah. i'll get your answer yeah. when will i get your answer but first time i give you my question and i get like a magical answer mm-hmm. second time i give i said first time aa gaya tha let's see second time what happens mm-hmm. 
two times, three times, five times. After that, will I ever have to think after giving you the question? So some answers are intuitive and some are not your answers, not even your intuition or your wisdom or whatever. It's just a direct, this is it. Yeah. This is it. And that's such a beautiful experience that after that you don't even want to feel like using your intuition. <laughs> Why use your intuition also? Because yeah. it's another experience. Yeah. But then because for that, you create a personal relationship. You don't just ask a question only at the time of a question. So okay. when will a child develop that relationship with the parent? Not only if the child goes only with problems. But when the child has a relationship where you're sharing everything, you're talking about everything, you're connecting everything, you're listening to what the parent is saying, you're trying to apply that in your life. So you've got a relationship, not that only the day I have my problem, I will come with that question. No, I'm sharing everything, everything, smallest thing, everything. So anything on my mind, I will not go and look for a person to go and share. Any okay. question I have not asked a human being for the last 25 years, 100% I have not asked any person. Why should I ask a person now after that? Mm -hmm. So that is the thing. So mm -hmm. that is when your relationship starts getting stronger and stronger. So it's a journey. Yeah. It's like any other relationship. Yeah. It's a journey. But it's a very beautiful experience. Yeah, and it is there for everyone to, for everyone. to experience. Oh, yes, for and everyone. Because even in the word my intuition, yeah. the word my comes. My comes. Because the ego yes. comes and then the outcome happens. You yeah. think you did yes. it. Yes. And the whole idea is to drop the ego, yes. right? So I think it's just intuition. Even my life. I mean, yes. let's go even to that extent. Yes. It's just life. Yeah. We are all there. And what you rightly said, it's it's all of life that is so beautifully interconnected. But, you know, I, we, I'm going to get into this section on the mindful minute, you know, where we're going to kind of, you know, ask a question, maybe within a minute, expect you to, to give an answer. Uh, and I know, a I know, spiritual way of a rapid fire. <laughs> <laughs> and in a, in a way that, uh, you know, we'll make it, uh, interesting and, and, and still, uh, you know, kind of get some points out, uh, as we, as we speak. And, and, you know, I'm going to start with you, Sister Shivani, because you mentioned white quite a lot in today's conversation. Uh, and, and, and I think, uh, why do you wear white? Why 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 white is uh, is the dress that we wear at the Brahma Kumaris. Um, not that we have to wear white. I like to wear white. And initially I was not wearing white. It doesn't mean that if you start coming to the center or you start practicing meditation, you have to wear white. Not at all. In fact, most of the people don't because they're going to play their roles, their responsibilities. Most of them love to come to the center wearing white, which they come for an hour every morning. So they wear white at that time and then they will change and go into. So even that myth that, oh, if we go here, we'll have to change what we are wearing. Not at all. So you continue wearing what you because it's actually not about this dress. It's not about this. But uh, when you are in an ashram where there are so many people living together, there has to be a certain uniformity. You are rising above, you know, your uh, thing towards clothes and towards your body consciousness here. So it's like the army. Everybody has one dress. It's like nurses, doctors, they will have one dress. So similarly, everyone living in the ashram together has one dress. Okay, so it's like that one dress. So white is chosen over here simply because white doesn't absorb. White only reflects. So that's one reason and white is closer to purity. So that's the color. So I was wearing colored even after I was coming to the center and I was going for meditation. I used to go back home and I used to wear colored. But then once the awakening program started and then I'm representing the organization everywhere. So I love to be in that permanently. This feels nice. Let's state And your one minute question is why orange? <laughs> so in the Sanatana Dharm tradition, this color of saffron is the color of sannyas. And it's really beautiful because it symbolizes two different things. It symbolizes the color of the sun at sunrise and sunset. Mm. And it's got a beautiful message in teaching, which is the sun gives and gives light, warmth, with no discrimination. Sun shines on everyone, every religion, every race, every color, every culture, every socioeconomic status, doesn't matter. Sun gives and gives, no discrimination, no expectation. It's never a matter of, oh, you did your Surya Namaskars, therefore you get some extra rays of sun today. You didn't, so you don't. No expectation, no hesitation. 
there's never a day that the sun says, ah, I don't really feel like it. Should I rise? Should I not? Maybe I have another option today. No hesitation and no vacation. Even in our winter time, when we have less light or in our night, when we have no light, that's just because the earth has rotated, but the sun is still on. Call your friends in Argentina or Chile and ask them what it's like when, you know, it's the middle of our winter. Call your friends in California, ask them what it's like in the middle of our night. The sun is on. And that the life of a sannyasi is meant to be like that. That we are meant to serve and serve and serve and give and give and give like the sun without discrimination, without expectation, without hesitation, and without vacation. And it's also the color of fire that purifies the mind. Who we are, the soul, of course, is already pure, doesn't need to be purified, but that purifies the mind, the thoughts, the intellect, so that we can recognize that truth of who we are, that soul. You know, as human beings, I think we always have this, this challenge of staying in that soulful zone 24-7. And, and I think I think what you described as your outfit or as you described your outfit, it helps you personally stay in that zone yeah. for the longest possible time. It so it's really one is. of the gateways, you know, as I would look or pathways to being able to do that. And I think there are so many for each person to discover, right? Sometimes you look at something and that brings you that gets you back into the zone. And I think all of us as individuals need to find what is it, like, you know, you said when logic takes over, how do you come back to being? And then whatever you do, do from that state of being. I think getting that, so to me, the the outfit, probably, I don't know, I could be wrong, but maybe that seems like one way. So to each person, you know, I think this is an individual choice that one should be comfortable with and derive inspiration or your relationship with what you wear. Maybe that's a good way to to look at it. The next mindful minute question, uh, and I'll start with you. You know, you've written a book, right? And I think both of you and I will come to that. Tell me about your book in a minute. <laughs> so <laughs> I've written several. I'll tell you about the most Whichever recent. Whichever one. Any I one book. A minute. Any one book. <laughs> we'll do the most recent, which is called Hollywood to the Himalayas. And it's a book that's very, very dear to my heart. It's actually Hollywood to the Himalayas, A Journey of Healing and Transformation. So it's got two arcs. One arc is my physical journey, quite literally from Hollywood to the Himalayas via Palo Alto, the San Francisco Bay Area. And it's a fascinating journey. It's, you know, the agony and the ecstasy of a spiritual life. But the second arc to me is actually even more important in the book and sharing in terms of that which made me write it, is the mindset shift. And this really takes us back actually to a lot of what we've been talking about because what I call the Hollywood way of thinking, which is pervasive, sadly, not only in Hollywood, but actually in much of the world, is that way of thinking that says you are your body. Its size, its shape, its color, its bank account, its history, where it's been, what's happened to it, what it's done, its popularity, its age, all of that. You are that. And when we identify as that, we suffer. We suffer feeling not enough. We suffer jealousy. We suffer competition. We suffer inferiority. We suffer all of that yearning and dying to be something more. The Himalayan way of thinking says you have a body, but you are not the body. You are soul. You are spirit. You are consciousness. You are divinity. So take care of your body. It's this beautiful mechanism through which you experience creation, through which you experience awakening, but it isn't you. And that mindset shift that I had and also the physical shift, is actually something that is possible for people wherever they are. You don't actually have to go from Hollywood to the Himalayas to make that shift. Wherever you are, you can make the shift. 
And it's a shift that really from my experience and what I've seen in so, so many people is a shift from suffering to the end of suffering. Yeah, no, so the power of creation and the ability to enjoy and experience that creation both really bring Hollywood and Himalayas together. Okay. One of the books, Sister Shivani, that you've written and which you feel you can describe in a minute. Recent one is it's called The Power of One Thought. So, experience of so many years says it all takes only one thought to shift. It's one thought, I'm not a body, I'm a soul. So one thought can shift me from anger to compassion. One thought can shift me from ego to humility. One thought can shift me from worry to surrender. All that it needs to change is one thought. So that book is about the power of one thought. <laughs> Amazing. And I think the, the, the concept of that one right thought one right or, thought. you know, getting think yes. right into yes. your life right. is, is in if you can make all your thoughts those those right thoughts is probably as we discussed things that can can that can move but we are also talking to some of you know the generations who have you know some preconceived notions about some things and i think one topic that came up with both of you was uh, meditation so if if we had to debunk one myth about meditation what 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 is that one myth about meditation that 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 you feel exists out there I cannot meditate. <laughs> That's what everybody says. I cannot Absolutely. meditate. Meditation is difficult. <laughs> it's only because we've not learned it and because we tend to nowadays go and search yeah. online and it'll be like a visual. So you get a visual where you see eyes closed and sitting here and we think it means you have to become thoughtless. So when we try it on our own, we try to become thoughtless. It's not possible to become thoughtless. So then people try and actually when you sit in silence, you'll have more of the thoughts coming because you've actually paused to even look that side. Mm -hmm. So they say, oh, I tried, but you know what? There was more thoughts. So I stopped and I gave up. So that's the myth, but we just need to learn. So we should stop saying meditation is difficult. I cannot meditate. That's the biggest one. For you, one, one myth about meditation that you think people have that they shouldn't? That meditation is a doing. People talk about doing meditation. And meditation is actually an undoing. It's an undoing of all of those layers, of all of the aspects of who I think I am. So I think of meditation as stopping to do all of the false identifications all of the stories in the mind, all of the attachments, all of the expectations, all of the role playing, all of that which we mostly do from morning till night, the yearnings, the aversions, the drive for this, the anger, the joy, this constant back and forth. Meditation is an undoing of all of that and a sinking into who you are. So it's not about got to do something because I'm going to outer space. It's I've got to stop doing <laughs> so I can go into inner space. Yeah. No, I think makes makes all of these things come out so true. But one other mindfulness exercise that people can do in under a minute outside of meditation, I mean, while meditation, is there any a mindfulness exercise that can get people more aware? Well, something that you can do in sure. under a minute. <laughs> Mindfulness itself is an exercise. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually, you know, it's its own practice. Anywhere you are, wherever you are, you can be mindful. I am mindful of my breath. I am mindful of the body where it is. Are you drinking water? Can you be mindful of that? Are you walking? You can be mindful of that. One of my favorite exercises, which can be done either as a long one or super short, is just neti neti, not this, not that. So anger arises. I'm about to think or say I am angry. And suddenly you kick in neti neti, not this, not that. I am not anger. You're walking down the street, you look in a shop window and you see your reflection and the mind goes, oh my God, you're so fat. 
or, oh my God, you're so skinny, or those clothes look awful, or whatever it may be. And just immediately, neti, neti. Neither am I that body, nor am I this commentary that is going on in my mind. So whatever it is that is arising, to just meet it lovingly, we're not berating it, we're not criticizing it, we're not condemning it, that's just another falsehood, but you're just meeting it with neti, neti. Not this, not that. One mindfulness exercise that you would recommend? What I've been practicing for the last few months is most of our waste thoughts are because of being critical or judgmental about people. If you ever see, there's more clutter about this, this, this. So for that one thought, so just fixed one thought for people and one thought for situations to put a full stop to all those waste thoughts. So just one thought, wo bahut achhe. And my mind said, So I just start saying it without giving a pause in between. And I've seen you just have to say it about five, six times, and those other thoughts are gone, which would have continued for like a few minutes. Okay, but, 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 why this, but, why that? It just goes away. It just completely goes away. And you suddenly feel, because you've created the right vibrational thought, and you've not created all those critical judgmental thoughts. So you can still go up to the person and give advice or give a direction or give an opinion, but not created all that clutter on the mind. So that saves you and it also gives the right energy to the other person. And the second is when a situation, you know, suddenly you feel this situation is not right. This was not correct. This should have not been. So immediately the first thought, everything is perfect. Everything is perfect. You get back to doing it and do, but not creating the clutter here. So these two thoughts, one is for people and one is for situation, just puts a full stop to all the clutter. Silence is here and you still go back to doing what you have to do, but with silence, not with noise. <laughs> Lovely. And my last question to both of you, I think, you know, both of you have, you know, so many people who listen to what you say and, you know, kind of, try and engage and you impact so many lives in so many ways what what do you learn when you are out in all of those is experiencing is it a constant journey of learning is it something that comes that changes and enhances the way you are because somewhere there is a belief that you know journey of life is lifelong learning right i mean sometimes we feel we've even the state of enlightenment, I think, is, or, you know, you say you reach some peak and then there is a way, you, the only way then is to go down, right? So, is there one learning that happens? Every time, you know, most of the time, because people will share their experiences and you realize how much power every soul has. Just yesterday, I can share two experiences. One couple, they come up and say, you know what, this always works, these affirmations always work. Have you heard people saying that? Yes. So that doctor, he's a surgeon, ortho surgeon. I got uh, this blood cancer, and he went to America. Then the wife said, the doctor said, fifteen percent chance of survival. And she said, fourth day, I told the doctor, doctor, you will see a miracle with us. She said, I just said it to him, and she said, that's it. After that, every food, water. She said, even the bone marrow, which was going to be, you know, for the transplant. Mm -hmm. She said, I just said, you are for our healing. He's perfect. This today, he's operating on other people. You know, so the, look at the magnitude Magic. of the situation yeah. which they came out only with using that Sankalp Siddhi and the power of affirmations. I was like, wow. And then there was this lady with whom I was in the car and we went to see her son who was just admitted. He was on the ventilator in the ICU, massive heart attack two days back. And uh, on the way back, I said, Aap theek hai? She said, Haan, dekhte hai, usko pehle jana hai ya mujhe. Jo bhi hona hai, usme kalyan hai. And then after five minutes, she asked me, Aap lunch kab khayenge? Mujhe aapke liye jalebi banani hai. And I said, <laughs> and I was asking myself, will I be able to also be in this kind of frame of mind that she is in right now? And she was not just saying it. It was yeah, very yeah. clear. She was yeah. not just saying it because she was saying it. That was her seva that day that she was going to make that jalebi. She was untouched by that situation. Absolutely. She'd gone there, met him, come back. Absolute. She said, Atma hai, usko pehle jana hai ya mujhe jana hai? <laughs> so much to learn every time yeah, from everybody. I, I feel like I'm constantly learning. 
I feel like every minute and every moment I'm learning. My favorite learnings come from nature, mm -hmm. from the trees, from the flowers, from the animals, from the way that nature is. I feel like I learn so, so much about equanimity, about resilience, about dharma, about individuality. I mean, no aspect of nature wishes that it could be like someone else. You never hear a rose bush wish that it could be like a jasmine or vice versa. And you see trees sometimes. I'm a big nature forest person. and. In the trees, in the forests, you know, obviously trees grow straight up. But every once in a while, you'll walk through a forest and you'll see a tree growing horizontal to the ground. Because for whatever reason, in that spot where she is, it was too much at the canopy. And trees need photosynthesis to live. They need that sunlight for all of their energy or the tree will die. And something intuitive, even as this high, she knew 25 feet up, if I grow straight, I will suffocate and die. My light is this way. Completely contrary to the way every other tree has ever grown. Without a guidebook, without, you know, needing some motivational video <laughs> to tell her it's okay, be yourself, just intuitively. And so for me, I feel like nature is one of my biggest teachers. So wherever I go, I always find myself paying attention to the leaves and the trees and the animals and the flowers and just wondering how can I be so giving? It's like that beautiful line in the poem by Khalil Gibran about giving that we should give the way that the flower gives its fragrance to the heel that has crushed it. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, can you give in a way like that? So for me, a lot of the learning is from nature, from people, of course. There's, there's just constantly so much to learn. And just lastly, I also feel like as I move through different situations and experiences that I learn so much about myself. Because on a spiritual path, you, you get to different aspects, or I should say I have gotten to different aspects where you feel like, oh, okay, I'm done with this now. I've worked with this issue. I'm done. Like we're clear, we're good. And then weeks go by or months go by or even years go by. And then suddenly yeah. you notice it arise yeah. and you realize, oh, <laughs> there you are done. again. <laughs> there you are again, a different way. But look, there is yet another layer to be peeled off yet another layer to remove so that I can drop deeper. There's yet another clearing that I need to do. And my personal prayer every day to God is always just, please make me empty. Just empty me more and more each day of all of that ignorance, all of that identification, all of that falsehood, so that there's more and more room for your grace to flow. And I find as I move through the world that each day, no matter how much you think you've cleared each day, wow, and then there is more. And then there is more to empty and more ways to surrender and more ways to offer yourself and more ways to empty yourself. And, and the, the more empty you get every time, the more you have to give. As a matter of fact, Absolutely. it's such a dichotomy because well, that's the beauty us, is that, right? And Physics I, tells yeah, us the universe absolutely. hates a vacuum, right? <laughs> and it's the yeah. same thing spiritually. I know, we are all engineers here and <laughs> we discuss the same thing again and again. And I have learned so much from both of you and thank you for such a engaging, inspirational, enthralling conversation. And I hope everybody who is who's hearing this has also taken away something from this conversation. And I, I think there are so many parts to this conversation that have come from, you know, trying to see how you can be your authentic self, discover that. And I think the whole subject as we were trying to open up this conversation with is a simple shift, one thought, one mindful, you know, opportunity to get mindful 
at an early age can just transform and make you experience life so differently and so beautifully like this whole conversation has been and you can be like that 24 7 you know rather than trying to fight clutters and so many other things that engage and engross you so much more so i think you know getting lighter and getting rid of a lot of things probably will enable one to lead a much better life but again thank you so much thank you for this conversation and that brings us to this end of another very engaging think right podcast thank you transform your life by downloading thinkright.me it's just that one moment that one mindful moment that can change the way you can unlock your true potential series of meditations affirmations different types of conversations and a little bit of thinking around what is right join us on thinkright.me and download it now